Uh, Sister Seema Imam was indicating that she did not have information, uh, more information to introduce me, and I, I am so glad she did that because, folks, we are here about you and about our country, and individuals are absolutely unimportant here. So thank you. You did me a very big favor by doing that. The main reason I'm here, let me begin. Good afternoon. Salaam alaikum. Shalom. Namaste. Satsri Akal. All possible greetings to everybody. I will begin with building upon what my dear friend Judge Anthony Simpkins indicated when he said in his talk that what Muslims seek in this country is no different from what other communities seek. And I'm here because we are all proud there should be a few more of those posters out there. There are women together, African Americans, Latinos, South Asian Americans, every possible immigrant community, every possible faith community, every possible non-faith community. What we all seek together, that's what Muslim Americans to seek. And in addition, what we have to contribute perhaps is a little bit more what we hope we can compete with the other communities in bettering this country. And today then, I'm here representing two different perspectives. As a Muslim American, I've been privileged to serve our community here through Friday sermons, read sermons on interfaith initiatives and engaging our government, state, and law enforcement groups on matters of civic and social importance. As a business leader managing a range of multinational companies across the world and dealing with major CEOs and businesses, I have focused on matters of globalization, of ethical leadership, and corporate sustainable responsibility. I raise both of those because somehow both those perspectives are important in today's election, the election to come. So I am here with renewed vigor, renewed vigor to point out the significance of November 8th. Yes, we can stand here and talk about what exactly is going on on the national stage and the local stage, but ultimately, my dear friends, what counts is that are we energized enough on November 8th to get up take our families and our friends out there and to build upon and act upon the courage of our convictions. So ultimately, whatever we are going to be talking about today, and Samreen and Salman, you folks have done a tremendous job pulling us all together. Sister Seema is doing a wonderful job with all her experience and background in rallying us for the cause, but all of that means everything or nothing if we are not able to get up on November 8th with the complete vigor that we are able to muster, get our friends, our families, and our associates out there to show up and cast our vote. What I can indicate from the Islamic perspective is that the significance of voting is important as a means of bringing about good. In the Noble Quran, the Lord exhorts us let there be among you a community calling to the good, enjoining right, forbidding wrong, and it is they who shall prosper. So I speak as a Muslim, I speak as an American when I say we have to go out there and vote, become informed citizens who understand what is at stake, and then make that choice, and then go ahead and vote, because that is part of what I consider is my responsibility to enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong. And then the prophetic tradition, which I'm sure so many of the people of other faiths are also familiar, where the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of the Lord be upon him, said, whoever sees something wrong, then let him change it with his hand. And if he's not able to, then let him change it with his tongue. And if he's not able to, then let him change it at least with his heart by recognizing what is wrong with conviction in our hearts. So when we speak about our role in the political system, in this particular election that is coming up, we have this opportunity as Muslims, and then we share that with people of all other faiths and our fellow Americans, that we feel what is going on is wrong. We feel that within our heart. Our hearts are pained and hurt and we are moved. And then we speak out against that, what is going on is wrong, but the most important and the most elevated form of action is that we go out and take action. And so, again, we all have to be prepared on November 8th, 
get up, go out there, and be prepared to vote. And friends, let's have a few reminders here. Let us be reminded that our vote is part of the foundational act that breathes life into the principle of the consent of the governed. And Abraham Lincoln uh, put it best when he said, the ballot is stronger than the bullet. And there's all this crazy talk about the Second Amendment rights being misconstrued and being taken into, unlawfully into hands. This is the bullet that we've been given that is peaceful and that is meaningful. And we need to take advantage of this and say, we will exercise the right to ballot. And having quoted the great Abraham Lincoln, I also have to quote him about a caution that he gave to us when he said, elections belong to the people. It is their decision. If they decide to turn their back on the fire and burn their behinds, then they will just have to sit on their blisters. We are not ones who will be sitting on our behinds, right? We are not ones who will sit on our blisters. We will be getting off our behinds. We will get our friends and families off their behinds and then we will go out there in the biggest numbers possible. And you know, what, what I find fascinating is there is talk about somehow there is a Republican strategy to depress the vote. I cannot imagine under these circumstances how could they possibly depress the vote of those who have been so hurt those who feel the pain, and those who want to bring about change. This has re-energized us. To me, there was no other election. I've been an, I'm an immigrant, a proud American now. I've been here 36 years. There's been no election that I've felt as energized. This is the first political rally that I've accepted Salman's invitation to come out and speak because, darn it, this is the time when we have to come out. So there's no talk about depressing the vote. Let's make sure we remind ourselves that we are energized uh, to vote. And as we, uh, as I come toward the end, I, I just have a few more minutes uh, left, I know. <coughs> the choice is, I don't need to spend any time on the choice. So many of the, my past speakers have done that. The choice is crystal clear for us folks. There is, in fact, that is the most frustrating aspect of the hearing the rhetoric is, how the heck are we comparing the two when there is no comparison? possible, not in terms of integrity, not in terms of moral values, not in terms of basic intelligence. And yet somehow our process of democracy has brought us here. So there is no better way for me to remind ourselves in view of this assault on family values, the absence of character, the, de the decency that has been dropped in public discourse, the degradation of women, the xenophobia, the racism, the bigotry, the anti-immigration hate, all of that that is going on, we should focus on what is energizing us to act. And perhaps the first lady put it best. So I cannot think of any better way than just quote it to She said, it's about basic human decency. It's about right and wrong. And we simply cannot endure this or expose our children to this any longer. Not for another minute and let alone for four years. Now is the time for all of us to stand up and say, enough is enough, and this has got to stop, stop right now. That was Lady Michelle Obama. And ladies and gentlemen, how do we stop it? We stop it with our vote. She said strong men, men who are truly role models, they do not need to put down women to themselves feel powerful. She said people who are truly strong lift others up. People who are truly powerful bring others together and we need to act upon that. And how do we act? We act by exercising our vote. And most recently, the president himself put it best when he said, you, we have a chance to reject a dark and pessimistic vision of a country where we turn against each other, where we turn away from our role in the world. We have an opportunity to reject a politics of fear and of resentment, of blame and anger and hate. We have the choice to choose the America. We know ourselves to be a country full of courage and optimism. And I cannot, then ladies and gentlemen, how do we start that movement? By our vote. It has to happen with exercising that right. And I cannot go back home in 
and assuage my conscience if I do not address what's going on with the Republican Party. I couldn't sleep with myself. And here again, I, uh, the best thing I can do is just quote President Obama when he said, if you say you're about family values, you have gotta be about family values all the way through. If you spend all these years extolling Reagan and how tough he was with the Russians, how is it that you suddenly stand silent like when you nominate a guy who says that he, a guy he admires is the former head of the KGB? If you say you are about the Constitution and you're opposed to what Obama is doing with executive actions and, uh, because that shows he's a tyrant, but you are then okay with a guy who says to his opponent in the middle of a debate, I am going to throw you in jail? How does that work is what President Obama asked. And the best way, and I think given all his wonderful eloquence, what I was most affected by was when he put all these questions and then he said, come on. Come on, man, do you believe that? Come on, man, can you act upon that? That was more powerful than so many other words that you could, you could have put up. So my dear friends, having gone through that, then let me conclude. Bringing it all together once again, we know the choice is so stark. Madam Clinton, when you speak about, and this is why I told, spoke to you about my leadership experience in business, I spent a lifetime in leadership development, a lifetime in how cultural transformation is essential for businesses to succeed, and I have focused for a lifetime on ethical leadership and the, and the need for leaders to be driven by firm integrity and moral values, and I look at the opposition, and, and there is no opposition here. There is no other choice. So when we have Madam Clinton out there before us, the choice is simple, but we need to be sure we don't just leave here. Yes, the samosas were wonderful, I'm sure, and the chai and the smell of curry. My dear friend uh, Bill Haddad, yes, he referred to that. But the point here is, my dear brothers and sisters and fellow Americans, fellow immigrants, everything matters only if we are out there ratcheting up the vote. So from now and in the few days that are left, each one of us, I leave us all with a challenge, including my wife and my niece, they're out here in the audience. The point is, you've heard my talk, I've just reflected what is deep inside your hearts. I know I speak for Congresswoman Tchaikovsky, because I've talked to her and I see the conviction and the passion with which she serves our country and our people. So I'm just regurgitating what you truly feel in your hearts. The whole point is, having heard this as a reminder, what are we going to do in the days that are left? I suggest the following. When you go back home, go to your personal uh, address book. We are all on all these WhatsApp and Yahoo messengers and the like. Let's make sure we tell them we were energized by this gathering today and my conscience was reminded and woken up and we are going to contact tens and if not hundreds of our friends and associates and family members and tell them you do not have a choice to stay back on November 8th. The choice is simple. You do not have to worry about telling them, think about Secretary Clinton because she's got no opposition, folks. There is no opposition here to worry about. But what we have to worry about is complacency that could end up giving this right away. So you have to send those messages out. You have to make those phone calls. Somebody in an Ahtabai, when you pull people together, just tell them to focus on getting the vote out. Who to vote for is no big deal here. We know the choice is simple. So let us remember, brothers and sisters, as I end, I go back to President Roosevelt where he said, a vote is like a rifle. Its usefulness depends upon the character of the user, and that is our biggest threat. We are people of character. Unlike the non-existent opposition to Madam Clinton, we are people of character, we are people of faith, we are people of integrity, we are people of moral values, and we want this country to be the best and remain as a beacon of hope and light and values to the entire world. And that can only happen if we get together with our friends, our families out there on November 8th, and then we shall vote together, and then we will be deserving of the changes that will God willing come. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. But once, uh, I, I, those, of, those of us who have heard me speak on community occasions and fundraisers will we'll see this, I do want a commitment from you. I just want one commitment along that line of action that I mentioned. 
Could you all give me a resounding yes or a deadly silence? I'm prepared for both, although I don't think that will happen. If you, if my word got through, that you will make sure each one will have at least 10 to 50 people mobilized personally to, to study and be prepared, registered, early voting, but go ahead and vote. Can I have that commitment from everybody here? Thank you so much. Proud to be an American, proud to be a Muslim, proud to be a part of this outstanding gathering. Thank you, Sister Thank you very, very much.